Hi. My name is Ed Mariano. I'm a professor of anesthesiology at Stanford University School of Medicine and chief of anesthesiology at the Veterans Affairs Palo Alto Healthcare System. It's a pleasure to speak to you today about prolonging the benefits of regional anesthesia, the best uses of additives and new agents. You can follow me on Twitter. My handle is at emarianomd. I have no uh, disclosures financially. And the first thing I wanted to do is really start out with asking a question. So how long should a block last? And this seems like a very simple question, but it's one that I think I've thought about for a long time, because to me, it seems like the way we teach regional anesthesia has been primarily based on the anesthesiologist deciding how long a block should last. But if I really think about what that means in terms of patient care, shouldn't we actually design a local anesthetic duration or the ideal op and optimal regional anesthetic block based on how long pain lasts, as opposed to how long we think it should last. If you look at the data, and these are data that my colleagues Karim el Baghdadli and Brian Ilfeld put together for the journal Anesthesia. If you scan the QR code um, with your camera phone, it'll take you directly to the link, and this is ac accessible free from the Anesthesia Journal site. And you see that surgeries don't have the same pain trajectory. And so granted, this is one patient population from one institution, but you, if you look at hip arthroplasty, knee arthroplasty, mastectomy, and shoulder arthroscopy, um, you know, one of those, as you can tell, um, you know, is uh, considered routine outpatient surgery. They don't have the same pain trajectory at all. And so someone having a knee replacement, for example, will tend to have this pain score range in the moderate uh, to severe, um, sometimes for up to a week before it starts to decline. Whereas for hip arthroplasty, which is also considered major surgery, it, those patients tend to have a, a rapidly declining pain trajectory, at least within this one population of surgical patients. Mastectomy, um, the scale is slightly different in the bottom left. You'll see we track patients up until post-op day eight. They have a fairly steep decline from days one to four. Um, and then shoulder arthroscopy patients, you know, we tracked for only three days after surgery, after they went home. Um, and their pain was reported uh, with movement as being moderate to severe for those uh, for almost the entire three-day period. Um, I think this actually should inform our decision-making as far as how long block should last, because really the question that should precede that is how long does pain last for our patients? And if you look specifically at the knee replacement patient population, these are data from Professor Lavendome from Belgium, um, which are with a very interesting study in which they followed patients having knee arthro arthroplasty uh, for several days uh, up to three months after surgery. And if you see here, at around day five after surgery, after patients have gone home in most of, most of our systems, that's when certain patients who will go on to develop neuropathic chronic pain, their pain actually increases. And I think that really should highlight the importance for us of how long our analgesic interventions really need to last and when it matters in terms of surveillance, because many of these patients we would never pick up. Um, and perhaps they would present um, to us as patients calling because they've used up their opioid prescriptions, or maybe they're showing up in the emergency department because of uncontrolled pain. Um, how many times do they, do they present themselves um, as perhaps labeled opioid seekers when really they're developing the beginnings of chronic pain. And I think in another important question that's re very relevant to this topic of prolonging nerve block benefits is how do you see pain medicine? Is it a one size fits all situation, um, which would be the top right um, where you do one thing and it's good enough for everyone? Or do you approach pain medicine and your approach to regional anesthesia? Is it more tailored where you, know, you identify the fact that there are certain subsects within a population and certain patients will respond differently to different interventions and certain, certain parts of the population may have greater needs or lesser needs you know, than the average patient. I think an interesting study that was just published by um, Patrick Kai and colleagues at the University of Florida, and again, you can scan the QR code with your camera to take you directly to the anesthesiology journal site, 
is that even looking at a broad group, this is from several hundred patients having multiple different kinds of surgery, um, they identified five distinct pain trajectories. And so if you look at this graph, these are five distinct lines that show pain after surgery. You'll see there's one very clear line, the dotted line that steeply decreases over the course of the first four days um, and then stays fairly low yeah, at the, uh, starting at day five. While there are other, the other four trajectories have a much steadier decline, uh, even slower decline, um, as some starting higher and staying higher um, in the uh, severe pain range, some is staying in more of the mild to moderate, and some staying mild the whole time. And what was interesting about this was that in this uh, particular study, the type of surgery did not, did not matter more than some other um, patient characteristics, um, but even still, we cannot yet identify all of the different factors that influence pain trajectory, but I think it just shows that the, we cannot assume that we know how patients will respond to surgical pain just by looking at them. Even just looking at the sample, there are five different ways that patients may respond after surgery to acute pain and pain resolution. So for this, this talk, I just wanted to cover three main things. So I wanted to talk about the additives for prolonging nerve block duration um, and cover, based on the available evidence, what we, what we know. I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, updates on continuous nerve blocks, um, because I still think that that's the gold standard. And then we'll talk about some practical considerations when making your decision. And if you choose to go with a more tailored approach, what that may look like. So first, let's talk about the available additives. Now, one thing I wanted to mention is that we know that we've had catheter technology for continuous peripheral nerve block you know, really now for over two decades. And I think that every single person has heard the phrase, well, we could place a catheter, but a single injection is fine. And I think that the reason why people tend to say single injection is fine and why this is so common, um, even in residency programs, almost every single place where, that I visited is for many factors and not the least of which is the time factor. There's a lot of productivity pressure in anesthesia and in the perioperative environment. And there is a lot of equipment that you have to gather um, when you're trying to place a catheter. And especially when you're at a teaching institution where you have to teach people how to place place catheters. So I completely understand this. Uh, that being said, um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, what we can offer in terms of trying to streamline that process. If you look at additives, I think the goal of the additive is to try to prolong the nerve block as long as possible while patients are still experiencing moderate to severe pain. And I think to do that, there are very few, if any, surgeries that I can think of um, that have pain um, after surgery that lasts less than one day. Um, even outpatient shoulder arth arthroscopy, which we saw those data, um, even after three days, those patients are still at least in a moderate range, if not still in severe pain. If you look at the available additives in the literature, and this is a, a summary um, emoji infographic that I borrowed from uh, Dr. Patrick Wong from the University of Ottawa. Yeah, these different uh, additives have very little evidence to support block duration greater than 24 hours. Um, and if you look at the ones that may, like buprenorphine or dexamethasone, you know, these represent off-label uses of these particular drugs since they were not designed to be added to local anesthetic for the purpose of nerve block. So I, I only caution people for using uh, different medications off-label, um, you know, but you can, you can be the judge based on your review of the clinical evidence. So based on this, there is no convincing additive to date that gives you reliable block duration more than a day um, whose mechanism we can actually um, understand and explain. There has even been some suggestion that more than one additive is better. Um, this is a study from uh, Dr. Kumar Bhuvanendran from Rush that uh, looked at in a basic science um, laboratory setting, um, 
up to a four drug combination. And those four drugs were the use of clonidine, the use of uh, local anesthetic, bupivacaine, uh, buprenorphine, and dexamethasone. And when he looked at this in this particular animal study, um, clonidine alone actually accounted for most of the prolongation of action. Um, and from the evidence that we have to date for clonidine, we know that clonidine primarily um, extends the duration of shorter acting local anesthetics, uh, which means that it doesn't reliably provide um, analgesia beyond that 24 hour mark alone. Now, I do think that it's important that we look at this graph again. And I, the reason I brought it up in the beginning is because we have to know how long pain lasts to know how long our additive or how long our block really should last. Um, and so uh, while I ask you, uh, knowing now that the evidence for additives um, does not reliably show block duration greater than a day, and knowing that these common surgeries, arth hip arthroplasty, knee arthroplasty, mastectomy, and shoulder arthroscopy, that they all reliably create pain um, in the moderate to severe range that lasts more than a day, how much difference does your block make, even if you put in those additives? And so I, I put this out there just because I think it's important that we think about the role of our block and really what kind of difference we're really making for patients in terms of their pain trajectory and recovery from surgery. Now let's look at liposomal bupivacaine. And this was uh, touted as a new pharmacologic agent that would provide extended duration um, anesthesia and analgesia. Um, for up to three days. And I put a question mark there because the studies since then in clinical patients have not shown reliably that the drug actually lasts for three days. Um, in the United States, you know, the Food and Drug Administration actually required the company to clarify uh, their advertising language so that that way they would stop advertising three days of pain relief because the data would not support that. It is important to think about this drug um, as a way to extend the duration of local anesthetic action, but it is in a non-titratable way. So you know, when you put this into uh, next to a nerve, and in the United States, it's only approved for interscaling blocks for shoulder sur surgery specifically. But when you put this near nerves, you cannot control the clinical effect that you're going to have. It is not titratable. If you happen to get um, analgesia and anesthesia from this block, then it will last as long as the drug lasts, which may be a day or more. Yeah, but even if you get side effects like phrenic nerve block, you will very likely get the duration um, that will be the same as what you would get for your clinical um, analgesic block. The reason why I question new here is because uh, even though it's been advertised recently as a new pharmacologic agent, liposomal bupivacaine is actually not new by itself. Um, these are two different studies that I've cited. One was actually published in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia in 1993. Um, and that study specifically looked at the use of liposomal bupivacaine for nerve blockade in animals. Um, what was interesting about this study is that they did show in animals that you could get 96 hours of block, uh, motor and sensory. But I questioned this asking, well, is 96 hours of block, especially when it's not titratable, always good? Because I do think it's important that we think about uh, not just how long a block should last in terms of pain control, but how do we minimize some of the side effects and some of the adverse effects um, when a patient, say, for example, does not like the numbness? What do we tell them? How reassuring are we as a physician if we tell them, well, I don't really know when it's going to wear off? Um, that's not very comforting for a patient who's distressed about a numb extremity. If we look closely at the literature for liposome bupivacaine, this is a great table from my friend Brian Ilfeld from University of California, San Diego. And he looked specifically at the studies um, based on what their outcome result was when you compared liposome bupivacaine to actual local anesthetics. So not against placebo, which is what um, our phase three FDA studies were required to do. But if you compare it to an active comparator, plain local anesthetic, which is already available and relatively inexpensive. What was the primary pain endpoint and who sponsored the study? When you looked at um, this, the majority of studies, you'll see here I highlighted them as all negative. Um, there, were, there were positive studies um, that did report benefit of liposome bupivacaine over bupivacaine, but there were only two of them in this article by Brian Ilfeld, and one of them was sponsored by the company. 
And so I would take this with, uh, definitely I would take this with some skepticism. Um, anytime you hear that light bulb zone will be pivocane um, is a major advance over plain long acting local anesthetic. And this study was just recently published in Anesthesiology, the journal. Um, and I think it is very convincing. Um, our colleagues at University of Toronto um, and, uh, and at the Ottawa University uh, put this out. Um, and it was a very nice systematic review and meta-analysis. I think the title actually says it all. Uh, perineural liposomal bupivacaine is not superior to non-liposomal bupivacaine for peripheral nerve block. Um, and if you look at some of their summary plots, yeah, this I put their uh, summary force plot down at the bottom, you see that the, the diamond crosses zero, which means that there's no effect and no difference um, between liposomal bupivacaine and, and plain bupivacaine. So next let's talk about um, the, some updates on continuous peripheral nerve blocks, because I think knowing that um, yeah, our own approach you know, for long acting analgesia um, in a targeted fashion tends to be based on this particular approach, I wanna explain where some of the data come from. So first, let's go back to this figure. So if you are someone who sees um, pain as not being the same for everyone, um, then I would tend to, to err towards continuous peripheral nerve block. It is the one regional analgesic technique that we have that not only provides longer lasting analgesia or local anesthetic effect, but it also is titratable in a way that allows us to treat patients differently. If you are in the camp of one size fits all medicine, and then perhaps you are interested in single injection and additives and new pharmacologic agents, um, because that approach assumes that every single patient will react the same way to surgery. Um, and based on the data that I've showed you already, we know that that's not true. So let's take a look at some of the data. So this is a meta-analysis from Jean-Louis Horn and his colleagues when he was at, uh, at Oregon Health and Science University. And if you look at the studies that compared continuous nerve block to single injection, um, this is their one force plot that showed satisfaction, but they showed other benefits as well in terms of um, pain scores and opioid consumption. But even in terms of patient satisfaction, which I think is a very important driver for us, especially in an era of uh, patient-centered outcomes um, and healthcare, uh, healthcare metrics that factor patient satisfaction, patients with continuous nerve blocks are more satisfied. And I think this is fairly clear based on this force plot. The reason why I think this is important is because there's a reason why patients are satisfied. And I don't believe it's just because of the duration of action. Um, I think that the titratability and the ability to personalize pain treatment, I think is a very big um, influence on patient satisfaction. So when we talk about the gold standard, and I, I would say that the gold standard for prolonging a nerve block action is a continuous catheter, then the way we do it tends to be very much based on epidural placement. So we insert a needle in proximity to a target nerve or plexus. Um, we can inject local anesthetic to, in order to create space and also establish the block. And then we pass a catheter through the needle, and then we use that to continually infuse local anesthetic. Things that we can do to, uh, that are practical considerations, I think, you know, to make it work are very important to cover because um, as I mentioned before, you know, we've all heard the data that support the use of continuous catheters, but, but there are so many reasons why people don't use them. And if they don't use them, then they can't be offered to patients and patients cannot benefit uh, from their activity. So how can we make it work? So let's talk first about ultrasound. I think ultrasound has been a, a re, has been revolutionary in regional anesthesia, and I think all of us would agree to that. Um, when we think about the use of ultrasound uh, for a more advanced procedure like continuous nerve block, I think it's critical that we think about ways that we can make the procedure more efficient, because. I think what matters in terms of providing regional anesthesia to patients is that not only do we provide something that is effective, but that it's also efficient because we know that the block that the patient is going to get is the one that you can get in the fastest and the most successfully because that's going to guarantee that the patients um, and that down, downstream you know, that receive the same operation and are you know, operated on by the same surgeon are likely to get the recommendation you know, from the operating room staff and surgical staff. 
if we look at the data, um, if we compare ultrasound guided catheters to our traditional stimulating guided catheters, then you'll see across the board that the times for placement are shorter with ultrasound. Um, the teal bars here, these are individual patient times for catheter placement, for popliteal, for femoral, for infraclavicular, and for interscaling catheters. The purple are all the patients placed with nerve stimulation. And while we can agree that the bars clearly show that average time is less, I think it's also important that we note that the highest, the longest times um, you know, are more populated with stimulation guided catheter patients than ultrasound guided catheter patients, which means that, at least in, in my terms, um, it means that you know, those those patients who receive ultrasound for catheter placement will not only have faster times to placement, but thus tend to stay in a very predictable duration, which I think is really key. Because if you talk to your colleagues around the operating room, you know, no one remembers the average time, but they always remember the longest time. So make sure that the longest time and the average time are pretty close. Um, and that way you're more likely to be able to get the chance to offer these to patients. I think when you're thinking about technique, it's important to consider catheter design. Um, I mentioned our technique, which is a through the needle catheter technique. Um, we have many different catheters you can choose from. There are single orifice and multi orifice, stimulating, non stimulating. You can use more plastic, rigid catheters, or you can use flexible catheters that are spring wound internally. Um, and now we even have over the needle or you know, over the needle catheters um, as, as, as opposed to through the needle catheters, which is a more of a traditional epidural. Uh, the over the needle catheters um, are thread more like an intravenous cannula. I think it's important to think about the effects of these catheter types when considering your placement technique, um, because we know the, the key for catheters is that they have to stay near the target in order to work. Anytime a catheter is dislodged, um, even if it's moved away from the target, although even if it's not completely withdrawn, that catheter is not going to work as well as it did when you first placed it. Uh, one of the cadaver-based studies that we did in our practice comparing through the needle flexible catheters to over the needle stiff catheters um, for popliteal sciatic um, placement in cadavers showed that if you can, you can place these catheters fairly easily um, you know, using uh, an in-plane um, short axis technique. However, you know, when you look at the, these bottom, this bottom row, you can see that the over the needle catheter tends to be very stiff and so when you flex and extend the knee in a patient who has a popliteal catheter with this device, you can see how the catheter tip migrates um, down here in D versus the, in B, this is post, uh, post movement, you see the catheter tip is still adjacent to the target nerve, which is shown in the dotted lines. And based on this study, we were able to conclude that um, those patients, those cadavers who had cath catheter over the needle um, placement had a higher rate of dislocation, um, which was actually over one in four uh, compared to through the needle catheters, you know, which were the flexible epidural type catheters we use in our practice. And so I do think that that's important. And so when you're thinking about catheter failure rates and you're trying to decrease catheter failure rates, make sure you use the right catheter for your placement technique. Because we use an in-plane short axis technique, um, our catheter is actually approaching the needle or approaching the target nerve in a perpendicular plane. And so the softer flexible catheter is less likely to be dislocated than the, the stiffer over the needle catheter. And then finally, I think you wanna make sure that your hard work doesn't go to waste. So once that catheter is in, then make sure you secure it very well. For, play, for sites of placement that are high movement or perhaps closer to a tourniquet placement um, where perhaps the drapes may accidentally dislodge the catheter, you may wanna consider tunneling those catheters um, or protecting them in some other way. I also think it's important that you use an anchoring device. Here's an example of one anchoring device we use in our practice. Um, this helps take the tension off of the connector piece from the connector to the catheter, and also make sure that the, the tension, um, in case a patient drops their infusion device, for example, you know, doesn't accidentally pull your catheter out. Make sure that you use plenty of liquid adhesive. Uh, we even use, um, yeah, we use uh, some glue just at the insertion site to decrease leakage at the site, um, and also make sure that it keeps our dressings from coming off prematurely. And so with that, hopefully I've given you some ideas as far as how to best prolong regional analgesia in patients. Um, 
and over given you a fairly good overview of how you can prolong nerve block duration with additives, what those shortcomings are of the additives, of course, um, and hopefully you've thought a lot about um, how long pain lasts in patients and how patients respond to surgery and pain in different ways. Because I think, in my opinion, you know, the, the biggest difference we can make for patients is ensuring that they have you know, the best recovery trajectory. And that's not going to be the same for every patient. So if we're going to be experts in regional anesthesia and analgesia, and we wanna match the patient's recovery trajectory to the interventions we provide, then we have to make sure that we can titrate those interventions so that way they last as long as the patient needs them and we can adjust the potency of our intervention to, to exactly what the patient needs when the patient needs it. Um, that's the only way that we can progress from just um, regional anesthesia to personalized pain medicine. Thank you so much for your attention and good luck with the rest of the Congress.